welcome, folks, to uh, the August edition of the uh, of the local history guild. This is a this is a, a back by popular demand one. We all liked it so much uh, that we agreed that we should do it again. Um, this uh, this whole subject of when steam ferries connected New Bedford to the Cape and Islands um, is you know it's it's a dynamic thing. I mean, we did a, a we did a whole exhibit about it in 1992. I didn't do it, um, but the museum did. And um, there, it was. It's quite a. There's quite a lot of serious scholarship, you know, really that goes into the, into um, you know the, the the transportation systems of New England and how that all worked. Um, and uh, so this evening, we had quite an extensive um, lineup of panelists, and due to one thing and another, uh, that lineup has shrunk considerably. Um, and so uh, Michael Harrison, you know, the curator at the Nantucket Historical Association, he had to bow out because he had to go to a fundraiser. And he assured me that he would have much he would much rather be doing a local history guild than doing a fundraiser. But as everybody on this uh, on this local history guild knows, it's very, very important for Michael Harrison to go raise money. Um, so go, Michael, um, do your thing. So he had to bow out. And then uh, and we had Bob DeManch uh, over in Fairhaven and. Uh, Bob had some quite serious technical difficulties, and uh, we will all keep our fingers crossed uh, that Bob will uh, will get that all ironed out and uh, and come come back in and um, and uh, and be with us here shortly. So, uh, in the meanwhile, um, our um, our presenters uh, this evening are Elizabeth York, the executive director of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. There she is. Hi, Elizabeth. And uh, and Bo Van Riper, uh, the research librarian at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. So these guys are, uh, you know, as you may recall from part one, uh, this, uh, we really got excited about Elizabeth's program. Or Bob Bob Demands got excited about Elizabeth's program and told me about it. Then I got excited about Elizabeth's program and we invited Elizabeth. And um, but being the local history guild and the the the, the entire um, there's Bob, the entire uh, connect, literal connectivity of this subject uh, demands that we have to have uh, all of us uh, together. Um, you know, in the, there's Bob, hey Bob. All of us together on uh, to, to discuss the subject. So um, uh, while Bob's getting, uh, getting his program together, uh, I'm gonna actually start, start things off uh, a little bit here. I've got nine slides to share uh, with you. Um, it's, it's not a tremendous amount of, of, um, of in-depth. I'll tell you what let's do. Bob's screen is up. So rather than my beginning and introduction, let's, uh, let's jump right into, um, right into Bob Demanche. Bob Demanche is a regular attendee at the Local History Guild. He's the primary author of the book, The Last of the Fairhaven Coasters, The Story of Captain Claude S. Tucker and the Schooner Coral. And in 2007, he produced the book, Eldred in Print, Recollections of a Fairhaven Artist for the late Albert F. Benack. Uh, so, Bob, you ready to take her away? Sure. Ready to go. All right. That's great. Let's get okay. that PowerPoint up in a full screen and, and hear uh, about day trippers. Good. Um, well, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and uh, glad asked to uh, thank you for being asked to share again on the second part of this. Um, I will uh, begin since other people are going to talk about different ports. I'll begin like I did last time and just get us oriented to uh, the uh, the area that we're going to be covering. Um, tonight. The red squares you see are the basic um, it, uh, ports. And I just, for um, simplicity, I refer to them as, quote, steamship authority, uh, because as you remember, the, um, uh, there are many um, uh, versions of New Bedford, uh, New Bedford, Oak Plus, uh, whatever, uh, Nantucket, or uh, who is named as the name of the ferry organization, but they are New Bedford. You see on the left side, down near Falmouth, the village of Woods Hole, um, Oak uh, Vineyard Haven and Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard, uh, Nantucket, 
and uh, on Nantucket and up uh, on the southern part of the Cape, uh, Hyannis. Okay, so I just want to have a quick uh, recap um, from our base here in uh, the New Bedford Harbor, which we see right here. Uh, there's a second steam ship line that we are uh, talking about, and that is the ferry between the uh, between New Bedford, as you see on the left side, and uh, Fairhaven on the right side, uh, and um, there was originally, the ferry started originally in 1833, going to New Bedford's Commercial Wharf, 1854. It switched over to the Railroad Wharf, and um, they went to uh, travel simply over to Steamboat Wharf across the harbor. And then, so here's a photo of a um, couple of uh, st uh, st uh, steamers at Steamboat Wharf in New Bedford. We see um, the signet here. This is Merrill's Wharf. This is a small steamer, and but the much larger, even though it's uh, look, doesn't look that way, is the Mono Hansett. is one of the more well known and well loved ferries. There were several of these uh, in in the system over the years. The Mono Hansett. Um, was much beloved also like the Novska and uh, I believe the Eagle's Wing. Um, and so this is here where the arrow is pointing is to the steamship wharf uh, at that time, about 1885 to 1889. And here's a current view of the um, steamship wharf here on the, it's in the center of the screen, the, um, you can just for you to, if you want to go down to see where that area is now, actually it's on the National uh, Register of Historic Places. I just read the, on the left side, the wharf area has been combined with, it's part of what is known as State Pier. We see the Ernestina in, in front here and there in back is where the uh, Cuddy Hump Ferry docks, um, in the middle again, that's a steamship wharf. And on the right with the bell, uh, there are several um, uh, either plaques or uh, the remembrances of Coast Guard, um, of the Coast Guard. So I'm just gonna talk about uh, some excursion destinations because uh, I just don't wanna admit that summer is coming to an end. I wanna, um, you know, keep it going. So I'll talk about a few of those. One will be Onset. The other will be uh, an excursion to Hadley's Harbor. Um, and there may be some others if there's a uh, time and, you know, Michael uh, will, will let me know how much time I have to go. Now, I do want to go to an early one. This is, you know, the steamboats really started to you know, after the initial 1807 with Fulton's uh, Claremont, the uh, it's uh, it by the 30s, it's they're starting to take some kind of shape, but they did have a lot of issues. I want to mention because here's a couple of clips from the um, Barnesville Patriot, and this, I tell you, in those days they could be really be tough. I mean, um, on uh, who is uh, uh, on what's happening, say. And so here's a, a, a notice. Uh, we notice that the Boston papers are saying the steamer Suffolk was supposed to leave Boston, but Plymouth, Duxbury, Sandwich, Yarmouth, and quote other places in the vicinity where a steamboat has never been seen. And a um, little snarkily, they say, we suppose that means Barnstable also. Uh, and return to Boston by Saturday, et cetera. She proposes to make excursion, excursions uh, to the harbors and, uh, and uh, they're gonna take gentlemen and parties, not sure what the parties refer to. Um, and uh, the and bottom here, it says, okay, doll 50 per day, including meals, cheap enough, here's go. For the accommodation of ladies, a good toned piano has been fixed in the cabin. And I'm not sure how to uh, take that, you know, interpret that, but uh, uh, <clears throat> at any rate, that's, but it's what they printed. And then about a week later, 
uh, and I'll, I'll skim through this, but we see the boat advertised for several days, et cetera, said it would show up and to the bottom on the left. Ah. Um, uh, <clears throat> we were on the lookout a couple of days to get a glimpse of that wonderful walk in the water of the Suffolk, but it turned out, ah, smoke. No steamboat came and speculation was rife and rumor busy about the probable cause of her non-appearance. We were happy to learn, however, that there was no bursting of boilers or scalding of bodies that caused the failure. The boat came as far as Sandwich, where she took out a party on Wednesday, but the power of the Suffolk's machinery was too feeble to allow her to make much headway against the little easterly breeze that was upon the water. And after treating our company rather shabbily, as we are informed, <clears throat> for a few hours, she returned to Sandwich, gave up the rest of the voyage, and made tracks back again for Boston. There we hope she will stay, for on the whole, we would think she was a miserable concern, more suitable. for towing gondolas around Boston Harbor with ladies on board. Um, they could be tough, I'll tell you. Uh, and they, uh, this transition to steamboats was not always smooth uh, as far as the populace went. The first one, uh, I'm going to Daniel uh, Richardson, um, uh, celebrated historian uh, in around the middle of the 1850s. Um, and in his history, of New Bedford, um, he talks about. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just get into it. But uh, I just want to show where where he's going. He's there, he's uh, taking uh, on the afternoon of June eighteen fifty six in company with a convenient congenial friend. I visited this island, um, and then we left New uh, New Bedford in less than two hours. Our gallant steamer, the Eagle's Wing, landed us at Hadley's Harbor on the east end of um, Noshon Island. The, <clears throat> and then he uh, goes about to describe their jaunt. Uh, I'm not sure where they, landed, where they landed, but it was the Eagle's Wing that brought them aboard. And um, their object was to see the natural beauties and productions of this comparatively unmolested realm of nature. Um, and it was just a very beautiful place, uh, un, uh, not touched by mu uh, humanity very much, a couple of houses, um, very sparsely settled. And he describes the flora and the fauna, um, bemoans the fact that the, you know, the, the deer are being shot by hunters. Um, but generally speaking, <clears throat> while most of the people, others in uh, a lot of other people uh, in the early uh, first half of the 1800s, they considered the Cape and areas such as this to be desert, desolate wastelands. And um, um, it's not until later in the 1800s that this attitude uh, changes. Um, <clears throat> but he does mention, and here, let's go to, I'll get to the next slide. And so, yes, uh, Daniel Rickerson, History of New Bedford. Um, I brought this out. This is a little sketch by a famous uh, artist painter from um, this area here, um, and um, known more for his uh, uh, scenes of, um, of whaling ships and also the Arctic regions. He was an early explorer of the Arctic as a... Uh, uh, person taking photographs and doing paintings, uh, William Bradford. But I put it, uh, I, I entered this because it's, it was just interesting that we have a sketch <clears throat> by Bradford of a vessel that's not at all a sailing vessel, um, the Eagle's Wing. Um, and so <clears throat> the, um, the point was that, uh, point is also that, um, this too was a, a, a vessel that was well liked, um, and it Rickardson's story of his uh, travels and the day he spent uh, with a with his buddy on the on um, Nashon um, exploring the area talked about the natural aspects um, that many uh, of the island 
that many people uh, might not pay much attention to. <clears throat> Here we have uh, one of the um, one of the places that <clears throat> started as a, as an it's a an area of Wareham on the water. Um, it like other places, it, the Native Americans uh, owned, or how you want to describe it, they traveled these lands, they used these lands, um, and English came and um, it stayed the farming and fishing uh, for many years. It was, uh, but in 1876, I believe, uh, <clears throat> Uh, several people from Boston who were interested in spiritualism were actually actively looking for a place to uh, <clears throat> uh, have a place in this area and um, you know develop it, have their camp meetings here. Uh, they had their own, and um, so the next year, uh, 1877 is, um, uh, you have the right term, but it's it's um, it's considered to be the excuse me the you know the beginning of the Oak Grove um, uh, spiritualism organization. Um, the <clears throat> and the, the steamboat was one of the ways that uh, many many of these people came to the camp meeting that they uh, uh, set, set up there. Uh, they bought the, uh, the early people from Boston came and bought the land um, and started developing it. Um, and not long, it was not long before uh, Onset was um, considered to be, you know, quite the place to go. And, and visit. Um, and you can see here, that's a, an early theme of theirs, Onset the Beautiful, um, which says, uh, <clears throat> which says it all because they, the, the land, initially it was a, a, a large stand of oak trees down to the water, beautiful sand, scenic islands in the, as you look out over there. Um, and it was a perfect place uh, for them. They were attracted by the beauty of it. And um, there was one uh, quote, and I don't have it uh, down here um, exactly, but basically uh, on the first page of this Onset the Beautiful uh, <clears throat> uh, promotional booklet, um, and this is the cover from 1925, it was this booklet was just chock full of photos and of uh, different businesses and uh, ads uh, promoting their own. Uh, and um, on the first page, the introduction, one of the points they make was that <clears throat> unlike other areas, meaning Cape Cod, yeah, I, they didn't say it, but they, was, they were definitely pointing it out. We don't have any signs along our beaches that say um, uh, you cannot come on these beaches, you know, you know uh, we own it and, and you don't. And so the openness was um, <clears throat> a, a thing they took pride in. And uh, I just put this last one here. Uh, I like this photo, the signet, the little signet, and you saw how small it is compared earlier to the Monahansett. And I'll just wrap up um, uh, in, in a second, but uh, going through the newspapers, it's really interesting. Um, the, the tidbits you get. And um, apparently the signet, even though this is a small vessel, it was owned by Jesse Sherman, who owned the big, powerful tugboats. Um, <clears throat> this was used as a shuttle uh, steamboat boat out to uh, Nonquit, um, more wealthier, most wealthy area uh, where people settled. Um, but it had a daily run out to Cuddy Hunk. And uh, it would it would stop at uh, Nonquit on the way out and on the way in. And an interesting thing, they didn't have a wharf at um, 
they didn't have any wharf at Cuddy Hunk. Um, and so you uh, were transferred from the Signet um, to a cat boat, and then you were um, sent in by cat boat for the last how many yards of the way to your uh, day or however long you would like to stay out in Cuyahoga. And um, I think that's going to wrap it up for me. I, I can, and maybe at some point there's other information that might be relative to someone else's conversation. But I would like to, uh, at this point, wrap it up. And uh, thanks for letting me share about uh, some interesting things. I yeah yeah yeah, 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 it's all great. I mean, what's really cool about this is that you know, uh, I wanted to put a few slides together myself, and we cover some of the same ter uh, territory. So, uh, let me uh, let me let me share, and we'll, we'll pick up. We're actually going to show at least oh, one of the same photographs. Um, um, uh, so let's see. We'll stop. Close we'll down. Stop here. screen sharing, and I will um, I will share mine. Uh, and um, and we'll get right into it uh, real quick. Um, so I, you know, I, I said it was an introduction. Um, we already had the introduction. <laughs> I mean, we had the introduction last time around. Uh, so uh, you know. What I find really interesting about this whole this whole structure of the story is is the is the expansion of of transportation and the the uh, the, the means with which as the 19th century progressed, technology, as Bob showed us, was rudimentary for steam in the 1830s, and it wasn't rudimentary uh, at all uh, by the early you know by the early 20th century this uh wonderful little uh map here you know shows the shows the the uh old colony rail connections uh and they go to new bedford you know newport fall river uh you know it goes across to falmouth and and we're dealing with this stuff right now you know we're trying to get that same train to run you know from new bedford to myricks to middleborough to boston so you know um you know the, the what let me read you something here this is this is just I find this particularly charming. The um, the uh, New Bedford Board of Trade they were uh, incredibly pleased with themselves about in about the eighteen eighties, um, and they they write you know in the uh, <clears throat> in the New Bedford, Massachusetts, the Board of Trade book, uh, the water economic and domestic. Uh, let's see, the water service of the New Bedford, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamboat Company is in the way of connecting the city intimately with Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. And in the summertime, furnishing the most delightful excursions that are at the same time transportation agencies along the southern Massachusetts shores over the waters, most attractive and interesting in her neighborhood and among scenes and two points that have become famous throughout the length and breadth of the land. So, uh, you know, the, the, the New Bedford Board of Trade uh, were very pleased with themselves, uh, indeed. And, uh, you know, this this sort of map here that, you know, that shows the the way the the connections built uh, is very important. And, you know, I'm glad Bob showed this photo. It's a great photo. I mean, it's one of the great waterfront photos of New Bedford, you know, with the Monhasset in the background and the, the steam propeller signet, um, which was, uh, uh, again, like he said, you know, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting little bit about what the signet actually did. It was, it was running mail from New Bedford to Nonquit. And Nonquit was a, uh, sort of a, a seaside summer community. Um, uh, and uh, it, it drew some, um, some fairly uh, wealthy, well-to-do and, uh, and important and famous people. Uh, Louisa May Alcott, for instance, the artist Arsween Gifford, um, uh, the General Sheridan from the Civil War, you know, um, uh, all lived there. Uh, but that little steam propeller signet, uh, you know, connected, it was easier to get there by water than it was to get there by land. So, um, so again, this is a fabulous photograph. And I think the signet is a very interesting little boat. Just poking around online, I, I saw this, um, 
This is a 1981 postcard, and I have no idea if the art is original to when. Uh, but I thought it was a charming little drawing. Um, we're going to buy the postcard for eight bucks. Um, you know, it's <laughs> it's online, so I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try to buy it just because I like the I like the um, I like the drawing. I think it's kind of cool. Um, now, this, on the other hand. This is just the opposite of that. This is a Benjamin Russell view from 1874 of the community of Nonquit with its sort of rudimentary pier. Now that pier would be extended out uh, much later and, uh, and would actually serve the community um, pretty significantly. So this is a really kind of a sweet little uh, primary source view of, of uh, South Dartmouth uh, from, the, from the 1870s. And here's the hotel. So the hotel was a big deal uh, in Nonquit, built in the early 1870s, and then it all burned down in the 1890s. But you could see it was a pretty, pretty major, uh, pretty major hotel. Uh, again, you know, if the rail comes to New Bedford, people can get on the Signet and go to Nonquit. Uh, and again, they could go on out to Nantucket if they want to and come back. Um, here's another one. You know, I, I like this postcard. This is really neat. Uh, just because it, you know, it, it's, it says on it, you know, I got this thing that's in the way, right in the way of the caption, and I don't know how to get rid of the thing. Um, but can somebody, is that black thing across the caption on everybody's screen? Across the top, what does that say? This is the, thank you. This is the boat that runs for the excursions Sunday to Cuddyhunk. So what do you think about that, Bob? There it is, excursions. That's the same word that you know, that, that you were using, you know, steamers for excursions to Duxbury and Plymouth and Hadley Harbor and elsewhere. It's kind of neat. <clears throat> this is a recent acquisition. The Blatchford family donated this uh, painting of the River Queen, Antonio Jacobson. Uh, beautiful painting. Um, and uh, the Blatchford family was involved in the old Colony Railroad uh, at some point. And the, um, and the New Bedford, what was it, the, the New Haven God, I always forget the name of it. What was the big railroad? The New Haven and New York and New Haven and Hartford. What is it? The New York, New Haven and Hartford. Thanks, Bo. That's the one. They were they were involved in, in that railroad, uh, but in the old Colony Railroad as well. So they, they donated this uh, beautiful painting. Uh, this is a Wendell, uh, is a um, Wendell Macy painting in, in awful condition. Um, it, it's uh, It's laying in a box. It's not hanging anywhere um but of the island home uh which was you know they 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 served together so the river queen and the island home um uh, you know served together um uh, in the in the late 19th century uh you know carrying passengers from new bedford out to the islands and i'm sure that uh Bo and uh, elizabeth can probably expand maybe a little bit more on on some of that uh this is another recent acquisition uh of this propeller potomska of new bedford which is a really cool thing this is a this was a, a pretty early propeller uh, that ran from New York to New Bedford, uh, and it, uh, a whole bunch of of really significant whaling agents in New Bedford invested in this thing, um, and uh, and we we acquired it in in 2021. Um, it it uh, it's it ran from uh, from New York to New Bedford until the Civil War, uh, and then the Navy bought her for a um, uh, for a let's see. Um, for a, car, a cargo carrier. So these are just some of the recent acquisitions that we have, you know, here at the museum um, relating to the subject. And, and I did, I did want to touch a little bit on, on some of the excursion stuff. So um, I will, um, I, I'll stop sharing uh, and we can uh, move on to Bo if you wish. Uh, you have a screen to share Bo? No, thank you. I don't have a screen to share, but I'll, if I could, what I'd like to do is more or less pick up where you left off. And I, you both mentioned the signet and I wanted to loop back just one more time. The signet never made its way out to Martha's Vineyard, but there was for about a hot second in the mid 1890s, a vessel of similar size named the city of Portsmouth that the founders of the summer resort at the tip of West Chop, the western headland of Vineyard Haven Harbor, hired to run back and forth between West Chop and Woods Hole 
thus giving them, oh, a half an hour shorter trip than they would have had if they'd taken the carriage up to the head of the harbor and boarded the big steamer that went through Woods Hole and on to New Bedford. Um, the city of Portsmouth was just a footnote in the history of steamers to the vineyard, but it was the first steamer in regular service to the island that used a propeller as opposed to paddle wheels. And in that respect, it was the shape of things to come because as I think Elizabeth is gonna talk about, the boats of the very early 20th century, first the side wheeler on Katina and then the screw steamer Sankety, not only bring about the transition from wooden hulls to steel hulls, but also the transition from paddle wheels to screw propellers. Um, I don't want to steal or thunder, but I did want to throw in my absolute favorite steamboat fact in the entire panoply, which is in the summers in Oak Bluffs at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a ballroom called the Tivoli. If you've ever been to Oak Bluffs, it stood where the OB police station is now, right across the head from the head of the steamer wharf. The band leader there was a guy named Will Hardy, and who was also a locally famous composer of popular songs. And when the Sankety came on the line just before World War I, he composed a waltz called Here Comes the Sankety with My Best Girl on Board, which we have, I am happy to say, copies of in the museum. I will not offend your listeners' ears by trying to sing it. Um, I will note that that is almost certainly the only song ever written about a Cape and Island steamer. Uh, oh, come on, you gotta, you gotta, Bo, you gotta, you gotta sing it. <laughs> no, I, I think not. But nobody ever looked at the current Sankety, which is an open deck freight boat and um, wax rhapsodic about that having anybody's best girl on board. Um. It's interesting that we've gotten onto the subject of excursions because as we talked about in the first installment of this, the steamers out of New Bedford and to a lesser extent Woods Hole served the vineyard in Nantucket not just as the conduit that brought the summer tourist trade, although they were certainly that and the summer tourist economies couldn't have existed without them but they were also the year round lifeline that brought cargo and that let people from the islands go to New Bedford to do their shopping or do their business with the banks or whatnot. And, but in the summer, the mainline boats like the River Queen, like the Monahansett, like the Island Home also ran excursions um, to onset as already noted, to the Uncatina when she came onto the line in 1902, had a huge electric searchlight mounted on her pilot house roof. And we've got flyers from the early 20th century advertising nighttime searchlight excursions. Basically, we'll steam up and down the sound and point the searchlight at things, which must have been a huge hit for with people living on the coast who suddenly had an umpty million candle power searchlight shining in their parlor window. Also, after the city of Columbus was wrecked off Gay Head in 1884, there was for a year or two a period when the steamboat company ran excursions that were their regular get on at Edgartown, Oak Bluffs, or Vineyard Haven and go to Gay Head for the day. But they made a point of saying, view the wreckage of the city of Columbus. So lest anybody think that disaster tourism is something that started with the 20th century, at least it didn't in Vineyard Sound. The I know Elizabeth is going to get into this, and so I won't um I won't go too deeply into it, but Looking back at those pictures of the Island Home and the River Queen, one of the things that struck me all over again is their design. They've got multiple decks which extend all the way from the bridge to the very the very fantail. So the only open low-lying deck on the entire ship 
is right at the bow, which meant that in the early 20th century, when automobiles started to become a thing on the island, started to become a thing that people from the mainland wanted to bring to the island, there's a period of about 20 years between, say, 1903 and the early 1920s when the I can't think of all the words either. The New Bedford, et cetera, steamboat company introduces the, the Islander, the Nobska, and, and their sisters. When if you wanted to bring a car to the island, it had to travel as deck cargo. You drove it out onto the dock. The deckhands put down a pair of stout planks from the dock down to the foredeck of the ferry. And then you or somebody else with more nerve than brains drove the car down the planks and it was lashed onto the foredeck. We've got pictures of some trips into Oak Bluffs with two or three cars lashed down to the foredeck like that. And you can only wonder at the level of commitment people had to bringing their cars to the islands if that was what it took to get them on and off if you were bringing them on the ferry. And that was why when the new generation of steamboats came in in a great rush in the early 1920s, they were designed for the first time with unobstructed main decks with side loading hatches that were intended for cars to be driven onto the vessel and intended for the entire lower deck to be able to handle cars. I mean, a, an incredible, overwhelming 25 cars in a single trip. But hey, hey, Bo, let me let me interrupt you for let me interrupt you for a moment. I'm sorry. When did the first automobile start turning up on Martha's Vineyard like that? First automobile on Martha's Vineyard that we know of was 1903. Huh. And by 1904, people were already complaining about the traffic. And, and when were people driving them on and off the off the steamers? Um, they were coming over as deck cargo for the first 20 years after that. And then beginning in 1923, when the side wheelers start to go out of service, huh. you start to be able on the new screw steamers to drive them directly onto the main deck on a level ramp. Wow, that's fascinating, huh? All I can say is I'm glad I live in the modern age. <laughs> Didn't have to do that. But the one of the interesting things about, and you had alluded to this, Michael, in your in your intro, is just how integrated the transportation network was. By I mean, in the era we were talking about in part one of this program, the period after the Civil War, say, the Vineyard and Nantucket were primarily resorts that drew their that drew their summer tourists from a relatively narrow swath of, say, Boston and Point South, Providence and Points East. By the late 19th century, the early 20th century, when the New York, New Haven, and Hartford has bought up not only the steamboat company, but also the old colony railroad, it becomes possible if you're living really anywhere from Portland, Maine, and an arc all the way down to New York City, to via the old colony, via the New York, New Haven, and Hartford, via the Fall River line coming up Nantucket Sound, you can start at any point on that arc and literally through check your baggage to the wharf in Vineyard Haven or Oak Bluffs and not have to worry about it because the New York, New Haven, and Hartford has created a completely integrated system designed to get you, if that's where you're going, to the islands. And that seems like a good place to wrap it up. Excellent. So what, Elizabeth, what's the, what's the, what's the story? What's the punchline here? I, I'm not that great with jokes, but I will <laughs> say that both, you basically just did a perfect teaser for what I'm going to be talking about. So great. that's good news. Um, so let me just get this started here real quick. So while we're talking about um, excursions, just while I get this open, the um, 
the precursor to the Highline Ferry out of Hyannis was um, essentially for day trippers to um, the island of Nantucket, which I think is really cool. And they 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 literally started as, um, and then they were sold to the current family that owns it. But they started as day trippers to Nantucket and would spend about forty five minutes, an hour and forty five on the island. Obviously, for day trippers, they wouldn't get too far onto the island, so they would mostly stay in that sort of downtown area. Um, but, you know, it's it's a great secondary use of these ferries. So thank you guys again. Um, so excited to be back for part two of Steamboats of Nantucket Sound. Um, I'm focusing today on the steamboats of the early mid to er, early 20th to the mid 20th century. Um, and so by this point, the major company, I know we've talked about this a few times already, the major company operating on these waters was the New Bedford Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Steamboat Company. Now, um, to save you guys from hearing me say that 8 million times, I'm going to be um, calling them the company from here on out, mostly because I'm just going to end up giving myself some sort of like tongue twister going on with it. Anyways, so I'm just going to be calling them the company to save all of us a little bit of heartache from saying that a million times. Perfect. So- all uh, right, let's get going. So in 1902, and Bo did a perfect, perfect teaser for this. In 1902, the company built the steel-hulled sidewheeler Uncatina. Um, you can see her here on the top. Uh, she was the first boat on the sound with an electric searchlight. We talked about that, um, about that boat um, probably surprising people out of their beds, thinking that they were being abducted by UFOs. Uh, they were also, it was also the first vessel with electricity and the first to carry the cars to the islands. Um, it could actually fit six aboard. Um, you can see that they would stow it all the way up on the front of the bow. Let me get my laser pointer out. The front of the bow here. That's where they would store those cars. So um, she was also used as an icebreaker because of her strong steel hull. Uh, she was a bit of a, uh, she was a different vessel from her precursors, from her older sisters, and that she did have that steel hull, so she wasn't made of wooden construction. So perfect use for her in the middle of the winter time, ice breaking. She was the last of the island steamers to have a walking beam engine as well. And it's around this time with the sort of loss of paddle wheels and walking beams that we're going to be seeing a big major change in the design and visuals of how these steamboats look. So in 1911, the company built the Sankity, which is pictured here in the bottom image. She was the first propeller driven boat on service to the islands. Um, specifically for the company. And she was also the first with a fully enclosed bow for freight instead of open like her predecessors. So this one's nice and open and this is fully enclosed. So what I find really interesting about the Sankity in particular is that design wise and sort of visuals wise, they did, um, while she was powered by propeller, they did sort of keep this paddle looking area here, this paddle box looking area here. Um, and while they, while it wasn't holding a paddle wheel, um, they did keep that look. And what it did allow them to do was to have um, more space for freight and more space for day rooms above. So freight down on this deck and then day rooms up here. All right, I'm going to put my laser pointer away. So after those two vessels, we come to the Great White Fleet, as they were affectionately known by the islanders. These were built in the 1920s, early 1920s to the late 1920s. Um, I like to think that they took the that they pulled the name of the Great White Fleet from the World War One fleet of battleships. Um, so the company first built uh, the Islander, which is pictured here on the top. She was launched in 1923. She was the second propeller-driven steamboat built especially for the island trade. She was a prototype for the other three steamers that are going to be coming a little bit later. She had these nice, smooth, clean lines, a pointed bow, and a sort of bellied out midsection. Her steam plant was a different, was a, was a, a, a change from previous years. She was a four-cylinder triple expansion reciprocating engine uh, built by Babcock and Wilcox, and she was propelled by a single screw or propeller. 
The citizens of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard considered her to be incredibly modern, and you can probably see why. Um, they considered her to be extremely sleek and very stylish. You could tell they were probably pretty proud of her. She was 210 feet overall and had a freight capacity of 100 tons, and she could, she could accommodate 200 passengers. In the summer of 1924, the Sankety, which we had seen on the previous slide, ended up burning to the waterline in New Bedford and was quickly sold. The company needed to replace the loss of the Sankety, so they quickly ordered a second steamer to replace, um, to replace her, and they ordered it to be exactly like the Islander. So the result for that was the Nobska pictured here. She was a near twin to the Islander. Nobska is on the bottom. Um, you'll probably notice how crowded she looks in this image here. And while this picture is not dated, the uh, prevailing thought is that this was a photograph taken during the America's Cup races when the vessel was used as a spectator boat. What's that lighthouse, Elizabeth? If it's America's Cup, it would be out by Newport, correct? I don't know. Further okay. research needed. I'll get back to you, Michael. Okay, I'm just curious. So the third vessel that was built for the company uh, was the New Bedford. Uh, she joined the White Fleet in 1928. She was the third new steamer launched by the company within the same decade, which I believe is really a testimony to the success that the line was having or the company was having, transporting vacationers and residents as well as freight back and forth between the islands and the mainland. Now, she was a bit similar to the Islander and the Nobska, but the main difference was that her entire main deck was left open for freight. Uh, so that gave her one third more freight space than her older sisters. And it was really at this point that the when the New Bedford was added to the line that the Islander's name was changed to Martha's Vineyard and then the Nobska was changed to Nantucket. So forget Islander, forget Nobska. Now it's Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. So finally, in 1929, the company introduced the Nashon, which was known to be the largest boat on the run. You can see that here in the bottom image. She was built at a cost of $600,000. Now, this is 1929, so that's quite impressive. She was a twin propeller boat, so she had one more propeller than her older sisters. She had four decks, so she was one deck higher than the other three. She followed the basic design of her sisters, but she was longer, wider, and of course, one deck higher. She had 32 staterooms over two decks. Now you may be saying, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang she was a day. She was a day boat. She was a boat going between the islands. Why did she have staterooms? You know, she's not an overnight boat, but it's great. It's a great point. The original plan for the Islander was that she would fill in as a night boat on the New York service. So the Fall oh. River Line service. Uh, during the winter months, which is why those staterooms would have come in handy. So the arrangement of two passenger decks uh, for the travelers on the Nashon was really novel and exciting for the passengers to have those day rooms and to have those staterooms available. The chairs in, in these rooms, chairs with cushions were interspersed with throughout. There was also a promenade deck or a promenade deck that was surrounded by a saloon deck. The staterooms were fitted with day beds as well as a Davenport, which would open to form a double bed. Pretty exciting. They were well provided, according to reports, with mattresses, cushions, tables, chairs, wash bowls. Um, and while it was well provided, it wasn't a simple yet attractive design. They have a piano? I'm sure they did, but only <laughs> for the ladies. That's the only way to get ladies to travel is with a piano. Gotta have the piano. So the Great White Fleet boats were a new class of steamers seen on Nantucket Sound. They were incredibly recognizable and incredibly popular uh, vessels that served the islands. Now, at this point, as Bo alluded to, the islands really had a solid reputation for being delightful and popular places to vacation, even if just for a weekend. These vessels allowed for that to happen. And as such, these steamers were really well traveled. They were well loved by many, 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 many people. So here's a few shots of the interior. This is of the Islander or the Martha's Vineyard, whichever year you're in. Um, so we have the writing room here on the right, and they would provide stationery for you to write a letter from um, and uh, post when you get to the island. 
And then on the right, uh, the left hand image is an image of the saloon deck. And we're looking forward on the um, on the on the port starboard side. Now, those doors lining that hallway there were the day rooms that passengers, which were usually um, th those that would rent them would be families or larger families. They could be rented uh, if they wanted a bit more privacy and comfort during their journey, you know, not to spend time with the plebs, but have their own private space to be in. So one of my favorite facts about the Great White Fleet is that in 1930, in order to save money, the steamers were painted gray which allowed the company to cut back on painting over the rust and the dirt and the uh, waterline uh, accumulation that these vessels would get. But I'm sure you can imagine now if it's all a gray painted fleet, what, it's a great white fleet. So the Islanders and the press were very, very critical of this decision. And I don't blame them. And they pretty quickly called for the return of the Great White Fleet instead of the Great Gray Fleet. And by the next year, all of the vessels were repainted in white. So while, yeah. not, while not very fancy on the interior, the boats were really graceful and proportionate and much better at sea than their side wheeler uh, predecessors. So the decline of the traditional paddle wheel steamer really began to take shape in the 1930s. For the company in particular, the Uncatina was the last side wheeler still in use by the line, but it was sold to the Nantasket Beach Line and renamed the Pemberton. Now, it was at this point that the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad was the parent company of the New England Steamship Company, which was the parent company of the island steamers. They were also the parent company of the Fall River Line, but they were two separate two separate uh, steamer lines at this point. They were not, the Fall River Line did not own the island steamers. In July of 1937, after a sit-down strike and, uh, of course, several years, several previous years of heavy financial losses, the New England Steamship Company decided to cease all of its steamship operations, such as the Fall River Line and the other lines that they owned. Now, unlike the Fall River Line, after a few weeks of striking, the island steamers and their crews went back to work. The New England Steamship Company, who had once owned 129 ships, now only had four ships left to carry their flag, and those four were the Great White Fleet. So in this picture here, um, both the Nashon and the New Bedford, the New Bedford being pictured here, uh, they were used by the U.S. government for uh, during World War II. They both served as hospital ships, bringing the first wounded back from Normandy to England. They also served as transports, bringing troops uh, across the English Channel. So while those two were in uh, Europe, it left only the Nantucket and the Martha's Vineyard as the two for all of the island services. Now, you can imagine um, everyone was making uh, major accommodations during World War II, but they literally decreased their fleet down to half going to the islands. So neither the New Bedford nor the Nashon returned returned to service on the island line after the war. Both were sold after the war to smaller companies in order to recoup some financial losses. After World War II, the Massachusetts Steamship Line um, bought the company and they purchased it for $750,000. At this point, the Islanders were really hopeful uh, that with the takeover by the Massachusetts Steamship Line that there would be improvement in service after the limitations caused by the loss of the Nashon and the New Bedford. Um, after the war, the line only had the two vessels left in service, the Martha's Vineyard and the Nantucket. Um, and many travelers were really frustrated by the constraining schedule that this would result in, not to mention the overcrowding of both passengers and cargo at that point. So their worries were really not abated at the appearance of their next vessel. This is the Islander, um, but originally it was named the Hackensack. Now, the Hackensack is, was a double-ended car ferry, uh, and it was used on the Hudson River by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, even though the ship was renamed the Islander to have a little bit more brand appeal by that point, 
she was commonly referred to as the hack, which I think is absolutely hilarious. So all of the islanders and the residents that would use this line frequently were used to seeing those ships in the great white fleet they were really not used to seeing the hacks short squat lines yet the double-ended ferry operation was incredibly practical and very much a precursor for modern travel so vehicles would be able to drive on one end on one end and drive right off the other end once they were at the other at their other destination hmm. and it would make things so hmm. much quicker really it's cool. so much and I swear, I promise, I apologize to everybody. I'm really not trying to body shame these boats, but when you look at the difference between the sort of the lines of the Great White Fleet and the hack, you can imagine why people were a little disappointed. So in 1947, the Massachusetts Steamship Line purchased a Navy LSM, which is a landing ship of medium size, and they had it converted for passenger use. They renamed it the Gay Head, again, to have a little bit of that familiar brand appeal. Uh, but it was soon discovered that the Gay Head was very difficult to maneuver around the docks and the crude passenger accommodations aboard and rough motion when underway filled many of those already very frustrated islanders with more frustration and disgust. Why had the line spent so much money on these two incredibly underwhelming vessels, they would be asking. Things really actually didn't get much better when the company suggested that they actually, that they wanted to curtail daily winter service to both of the islands operating on an every other day basis. So public indignation by this point was at a new, at a new level. So Representative Joseph Sylvia of Martha's Vineyard submitted a bill calling for the immediate investigation of the steamboat service to the islands. A commission was established, and after an investigation, it was stated that it was obvious that a private entity could not proper, properly, excuse me, properly and profitably serve the islands on a year-round basis. As a result of their findings, a state authority established was established by an act of the legislature that was signed June 11, 1948. After nearly a year of negotiations and transfer of properties from Massachusetts Steamship Lines to the state authority, the line was sold to the state for $1.375 million. The line was taken over by the New Bedford, Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamship Authority. The authority was comprised of five members, one from each of the community that the line served, plus a member selected at random by the governor. What a fun job. To make things easier for all of us, and again, so that I don't have to keep repeating all those cities over and over and over again, I'm going to refer to it as the Steamship Authority. Now, even though the Islanders were now promised a continued year-round service on a daily basis, that didn't really mean that the newly established authority didn't have to deal with the same old problems that the steamship, that the company, that the company's lines had before. Plus, they also had some pretty complex new problems to deal with. So the Steamship Authority, while legally guaranteed protection on Nantucket Sound from competition of vessels over 100 tons, they were not protected from competition of smaller craft. Hyannis Steamship Lines at this point was running from Hyannis to Nantucket. I sort of alluded to this at the beginning of my talk. The first year in business in 1946, they carried 15,000 passengers throughout the year, not all at once, but throughout the year. Um, between Hyannis and Nantucket. Their second year in business, they carried 25,000 passengers. They were using two ex-Coast Guard boats, which they named Iana and the Nautican. The great advantage of these smaller lines was that they did not have to operate year-round like the Authority did. And as soon as the busy summer months were over and demand died down, they could actually close down. While the Authority boats were really left to run through the colder and offer an often profitless winter months. Mm. So the first order of business for the authority was to build a new vessel specifically to replace the outdated and disliked hack. Designed for service to the vineyard, she was a double-ended ferry and named the Islander, just like her hack predecessor. She was constructed specifically to be a, work, a workhorse for the line, and she was economical, functional, and capable of decades of use. Now, like the hack, she was also not the most beautiful to look at, but was really um, sort of a turning of the page, a new chapter for vessels on Nantucket Sound. Now, 
again, I'm not body shaming this, these boats, but it really was a major departure from that earlier paddle wheeler, the Oncatina that we saw earlier and the island home. And you couldn't get any more yin and yang. Now, while she was a visual departure from earlier boats, she was the most often, she was most often used in service to the vineyard and she proved to be a huge moneymaker for the authority. So she was a great success. So the 1960s, while I wrap up a little bit, the 1960s were really not the best time for the authority. Um, they, in April of 1960, they had a strike over the lack of manning of the crews. The crews were really overworked. Now, this was April of 1960, so as summertime approached, the islanders and the crews were getting a little bit nervous, and eventually, and eventually by July 2nd, the strike ended. However, the islanders and the frequent uh, the frequent riders on these lines were really outraged. So a bill was made that called for the reorganization of the authority, which went into effect on January 1st, 1961. The authority at this point was now called just the Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamship Authority. Unfortunately, New Bedford was dropped from the terminus uh, as a terminus at this point. It was deemed simply too far away to warrant the expense of running a vessel out of. Woods Hole, after 1960, was the only year-round mainland port. Daily summer trips to Hyannis were actually reinstated in 1973, and that was the first time in over 99 years that a vessel owned by the company entered Hyannis Harbor. The Hyannis Terminus helped ease the crush of passengers, cars, and freight at Woods Hole, especially in the summer, and it also offered a relief from their summertime competitors like the um, Hyannis the Hyannis line. Importantly, it provided Nantucket residents with a shorter trip as well as access to the commercial shopping of the growing professional services of the Mid-Cape at that point. Now, later boats, which we're not going to get into today, maybe part three or part trois, later <laughs> boats built by the authority were a major departure in design from the previous years. Now gone were those staterooms and um, the bench and lounge style seating, those large, comfortable bathrooms and the interconnectivity um, amongst the vessel. Seats were now on um, the Steamship Authority bus style. The lunchroom was located in only one passenger area, which didn't connect directly to the other um, unless one descended to the freight deck and crossed over. And the restrooms were uh, described as broom closets. So the luxury and comfort of that sort of of that 19th century and the early 20th century uh, trip to an island had really gone, but it was mostly just replaced by utility and convenience because it was becoming a shorter and shorter trip. So, you know, it's, it's you, you get what you get. The Steamship Authority is the only ferry service to the islands that carries both passenger and freight. The, they currently operate 10 vessels today and they carry passengers, automobiles and freight trucks. Um, and for me, and I'm a little bit biased, but the story of the steamers is really one of incredible evolution and development, not only in design, uh, construction and propulsion, but really in our region's culture and international visibility. From, you know, a couple centuries ago to today, the boats have served as the main line, the main lifeline to the islands uh, for visitors and for residents. And thankfully, they still continue to serve that purpose. Yes. Um, we'd be in, a, we'd have to uh, row ourselves over there. So that's it for me. Great stuff. Um, you know, the, something that strikes me that sort of runs through this is the, the, the recreational sort of quality that, I mean, as Bo said, you know, yeah, people needed, uh, people needed to get to um, to New Bedford, for instance, to do shopping, and that there was a practicality to the whole thing. But but there's also a sort of recreational quality to to life on the vineyard, life on Cape Cod, life on Nantucket. You know that that it sort of shifts the intent a little bit in a way. Um, much the way that Newport, you know, became a kind of a, uh, a kind of a, uh, a playground, uh, for lack of a better word, for wealthy people. Um, you see, you know, Nonquit is not a practical community. It's a, uh, it's a seaside sort of, it's not a resort. It's a, 
it was just a it was a uh, a well a well to do sort of um, summer place to visit, um, <clears throat> and so you know the the strict practicality you know of connecting the the regions seems to have a, a, a kind of a recreational quality, you know, as it goes along. Very good point. And I think that um, especially the, the Cape and the islands, um, their economy really developed because of recreation. I mean, when we think about our um a lot of our boat building, for example, was based off of sailing and based off of, you know, the different types of, um, you know, areas that people would sail out of. And I think that the, the sort of recreational aspect of our region has always been so such a major driver, um, you know, people going to the beach, going to, um, you know, stay at their really beautiful hotels and um uh, Oak Bluffs and I think I can't remember the name of the one that burnt down um, Bo you'd probably be able to tell us there was that really really nice hotel um, right next to the uh, the railroad line on the island that right the sea view it was yeah. at, the head of the, at the head of the steamer wharf and you could literally yes. walk off your boat and into the lobby and see and and be seen while you're there you know mm-hmm. see yeah. all the you know the the, the the top tier people and, you know, report back to your friends on it. And um, yeah, it's been a major driver of. It's, it's fun to, th- it's really interesting to, to see the whole picture, you know, that the whole sense of the rail and the, and the, and the connectivity of the, of the steamers and, and the, you know, water transport. And then, you know, and then New Bedford's out of the picture because it's not economical anymore. And, and, you know, you've got the bridges, the bridges are built and people are driving to the Cape and, uh, you know, and then, you know, you use the term workhorse, you know, in, in, in some ways, you know, that's really qu- quite what it is, you know, it's <laughs> the, the, the excursion quality uh, is pretty much absent as it's merely getting from point A to point B and uh, how much is it going to cost to get my car on there, you know, right. so yeah, it's interesting, I think. Um, I don't see a lot of questions from our participants. I uh, uh, have a question actually myself. Who's that? Yeah. Bob? Yeah. Um, how, uh, how how is the um, what's the effect of the sea streak, the fast ferries? Uh, you talked about going from point to point. Um, that seems a prime example of just trying to get from point to point the fastest way. Um, uh, first of all, I'm not sure, are they owned by the Steamship Authority also? And um, um, what kind of, yeah, maybe that's the result of, uh, or the end result of all these years of evolution that, um, you know, again, you want to get from point A to point B, uh, the easiest, the quickest, the less, uh, the less number of um, segments to your journey. Um, uh, to make it as convenient as possible. Um, has that had any effect on, uh, I don't know. Uh, the- I think it's, I think the fast ferries have made a major, major, major difference in travel to the island. Um, the Steamship Authority has one that they operate um, uh, to um, Nantucket. Um, and I believe it also goes between Martha's Vineyard and um, Hyannis. I think it does this sort of three. Um, but the High Line, for example, um, is when you compare the High Line with the Steamship Authority. And I see this literally every day when I go into work right in between the two um, terminus. The the passengers on both are, I would say there's, it, it, there's a fair split between people who would take the... Um, the fast ferry on steamship versus Highline, and I, I think it's I think you've I think you've got it. I think it's convenience. I think it's just you know to make life as easy as possible um, to get from one place to the other. Um, 
and I don't, I don't blame them. I, I if you, if you want to go on a vacation, uh, you know, for some, for some, it's, you know, it's, it's all about the journey. For some people, it's all about where you end up. Um, I'm a person who just wants to get there. So, um, I, you know, I get Pretty it. Convenient. Yep. Hey, uh, uh, participant Susan has a question. There's Susan. Hi, this is uh, kind of along with what you're saying. I, I'm wondering, um, you know, how long the 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 uh, commute was with the, you know, the steamboats. Like, how long would it take as opposed to now? It's like, you know, from Woods Hole to Martha's Vineyard, it's like 45 minutes. How long would that trip take hmm. when it had the, you know, when they were using the steamboats? The trip would be more like... Um... For let's say if you're going from Woods Hole um, to Nantucket, it would be close to about three hours. Wow. Three hours. Wow. One of the earliest, one of the earliest steamers that they time. used. Yes, one of the earliest steamers they used was almost six hours. So um, that is a that is not a day trip anymore. That is a you're spending a weekend there. Mm -hmm. um, the you know, and as these vessels got faster, and as they did explore. Um, you know, Hyannis as a terminus again, of course, that voyage to Nantucket is a lot shorter. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. That answers my question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. Well, when Rickinson took that, uh, the trip to uh, the uh, eastern end of uh, Nashon Island, it was a two hour, two hour trip. Two hours from New Bedford to Notion Island? Uh, well, to Hadley Harbor. He, he, right. he said it was two hours later we were at Hadley Harbor. Right, that was the Eagle Wing. It took him yeah, two that hours was around, to go seven miles. Yeah, 19, uh, 1854, 56, right. something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I also, uh, I mean, I only see it from, you know, where I, when I'm down uh, getting coffee, you know, you know, in the historic area in New Bedford, I see a lot of people who are, old, you know, uh, have crossed the highway uh, and have stopped into the, to the historic area for some reason. Um, I do see a lot of cars in the parking lot up there, you know, for the uh, C Street. I mean, I think it's, um, it's, uh, it, it's been a, a helpful thing for the city, um, discovering the city for people, uh, you know, having to, um, you know. We'll so see what happens when the train happening. finally comes and we're, and we're right back to, you know, 1865 where we belong. <laughs> we'll be able to, people will be able to get on the train and, and, and uh, you know, and you can go from, well, you can, I guess you can go from the, from the Cape on the train anyway. But. Yeah. Well, one of the high-speed catamaran companies runs a boat from Manhattan and New Jersey up to up to Oak Bluffs every Friday and back every Sunday. So, shades of the Fall River line. Yep. I love that. I love that. We should um, we should charter it and have everybody dress up and you know play some of that awesome nineteen twenties you know tinkly yeah. piano. Okay. Like one of those the ladies like so much <laughs> railroad posters. Bring a piano. The family that owns the uh, C Street Company owns Interlake Steamship Fleet. That's a fun fact. So they are huge fans of steamboats. Say that again, Beatrice. What was that? The C Street family, the markers, they also own the Interlake Steamship Fleet. Oh. Hmm. The Great Lakes uh, steamships. Mm -hmm. Well, well, folks, thank you all for coming out tonight. This has been a, a pretty great thing. Um, for you know, for September, we're uh, we're working on a program on on pirates and privateers, uh, and uh, there's been some some great scholarship that's been done on this. And um, uh, there's it's a rich topic. Um, so uh, we're we're building a we're building a, um, uh, a selection of you know we're building a panel uh, to talk about that. Um, but uh, this has been, you know, really pretty rich uh, all by itself. And um, I thank you all. Uh, I thank you all for, for coming out. And we thank uh, Beatrice uh, 
Oliveira, our, um, um, she is our programs uh, director. Um, and uh, she's, she's taking this on. And Carissa, you know, Carissa, Carissa moved on. She, she took another job. And so Beatrice had to fill in for, uh, for, for Carissa Walker, who was, um, who, you know, who was, who was managing the local history guild for, uh, for so long. So um, it's that awkward time of the evening where we have to hit the button and then we're done. Um, but thank you all, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Bo, Bob. Um, thank you all for, uh, for participating and, um, and we'll see you next month, I guess.